Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In Afghanistan, the death toll in Wednesday's massive truck bomb attack in Kabul has risen to 90, with over 400 people wounded, as Afghans mourn one of the worst single attacks since the U.S. invaded Afghanistan in 2001. No group has claimed responsibility for the bombing, which struck a busy intersection in the heart of the Afghan capital during the morning rush hour, flattening buildings, damaging embassies and shattering windows at the presidential palace. Many survivors blame the government for failing to provide security. We ask our leaders to ensure security in the country, or if they are not able to ensure security for us, we say they must resign. There should be someone in power who serves the country. Right now, thousands of our people are in mourning. Why and how much longer should we suffer from this current situation? On Thursday, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani issued a decree ordering the execution of 11 prisoners from the Taliban and the Haqqani network, which officials blamed for the attack. Meanwhile, in Baghdad, Iraq, ISIS has claimed responsibility for a car bomb that killed at least 16 people and wounded 75 others when it ripped through an ice cream parlor Tuesday. A second explosion in Baghdad Tuesday targeted Iraq's pension office, killing 11 people and wounding 41 others. In Washington, D.C., President Donald Trump reportedly plans to pull the U.S. out of the landmark Paris Climate Accord, a decision environmentalists warn will be a crime against the future of the planet and humanity. In a tweet, President Trump said he would announce his decision at 3 p.m. at the White House Rose Garden. In 2015, nearly 200 nations agreed in Paris to the Global Accord to curb rising greenhouse gas emissions blamed for warming the planet. On Wednesday, in Brussels, Belgium, members of the the European Parliament booed reports that Trump will likely pull the U.S. out of the deal. European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker said the administration will have a hard time withdrawing. That's not how it works. The Americans can't just leave the Climate Protection Agreement. Mr. Trump believes that because he doesn't get close enough to the dossiers to fully understand them, it would take three to four years after the agreement came into force in November 2016 to leave the agreement. So this notion, I am Trump, I am American, America first, and I am going to get out of it, that won't happen. The Guardian's reporting China and the European Union plan to forge an alliance to take a leading role in tackling climate change in response to Trump's expected decision to pull out of the accord. The new alliance will reportedly focus on leading the energy transition toward a low-carbon economy. We'll have more on President Trump and the Paris Accord after headlines. In Sri Lanka, the death toll has risen to 180, with nearly 600,000 people displaced amidst the worst flooding in the country in the last 14 years. Scientists have linked torrential rain rains and increased flooding in Sri Lanka to climate change. Meanwhile, in Bangladesh, thousands of Rohingya Muslims from neighboring Burma were left homeless after a cyclone devastated their makeshift refugee camps. The storm prompted the evacuation of the Cox's Bazaar district on the coast, but many Rohingya refugees had nowhere to go. They were left without shelter after nearly all the camp's 10,000 thatched huts were flattened. Rohingyas have long faced persecution and violence in Burma, where they're denied citizenship. Back in the United States, CNN is reporting Attorney General Jeff Sessions may have had an additional private meeting with Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak during the presidential campaign. Sessions already faces charges he perjured himself during a Senate confirmation hearing in January when he testified he didn't have any communications with the Russians ahead of the November election. In fact, Sessions had at least two meetings with Ambassador Kislyak, and if CNN's report is true, there was a third meeting in April of last year. The Wall Street Journal Journal reports embattled chair of the House Intelligence Committee, Devin Nunes, unilaterally issued three subpoenas to the FBI, the CIA and the National Security Agency, seeking to learn how the names of Trump associates were unmasked in classified intelligence reports. Nunes's subpoenas are unrelated to his committee's investigation into charges that Russia meddled in the 2016 election and came without the approval of Democrats, who say Nunes is seeking to distract from the committee's work. Nunes previously 
previously said he would recuse himself from the Russia investigation. Meanwhile, The Guardian's reporting that far-right British politician Nigel Farage, who led the Brexit campaign to exit the European Union, has been named as a person of interest in the FBI's investigation into Russia and the Trump Organization. The Guardian reports Farage is being scrutinized because of his relationships with individuals connected to both the Trump campaign and WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. At the White House, Press Secretary Sean Spicer said Wednesday he will no longer field questions about Russia's ties to Donald Trump and his associates and will instead refer reporters to Trump's personal attorney, Mark Kasowitz. Spicer made the comments in an audio-only press briefing, after barring video coverage and declaring that networks should not broadcast his remarks live. During the briefing, Spicer asked, was asked about a bizarre tweet posted by President Trump early Wednesday, which read, quote, despite the constant negative press kofifi. Do you think people should be concerned um, that the president posted somewhat of an incoherent tweet last night and that it then stayed up for hours? Uh, no. Why did it stay up so long? Is, is no one watching this? No, I, I think the, the, uh, the president and a small group of people know exactly what he meant. The audio-only press briefing came one day after Spicer stormed out of Tuesday's press briefing, when reporters drilled him over President Trump's claims that their reporting constituted fake news. In China, one labor activist was arrested and two others have gone missing and are feared detained as they investigated abuses at a factory that produces shoes for the Ivanka Trump brand. China Labor Watch said the activists uncovered evidence that factory workers were forced to work excessive overtime, were verbally abused, and paid wages below China's legal minimum, with some workers receiving less than a dollar an hour. Amnesty International called on China to immediately release the three activists. The arrest and disappearances came just weeks after Ivanka Trump secured three new exclusive trademarks in China. The very same day, she and her father, President Trump, had dinner with Chinese President Xi Jinping at Trump's private resort in Florida. The city of New York said Wednesday it will begin cutting its ties to Wells Fargo, following a scandal that saw thousands of employees set up more than two million phony bank and credit card accounts. New York came under intense pressure to divest from Wells Fargo by Native American activists opposed to the bank's support for the $3.8 billion Dakota Access Pipeline. In Portland, Oregon, the mother of one of two men stabbed to death by a white supremacist as they defended a Muslim teenager on a train is calling on President Trump to condemn hate groups, many of whom support his presidency. Asha Deliverance, the mother of 23-year-old Tulishin Mirdin Namkai Mechi, wrote in an open letter to Trump, quote, you have said that you will be president for all Americans, so I ask you, Mr. President, to take action at this time. Please condemn any acts of violence which result directly from hate speech and hate groups, she wrote. The letter came after the suspect in the killings, Jeremy Christian, made a defiant statement at his arraignment Tuesday, shouting, death to the enemies of America, and you call it terrorism, I call it patriotism. In Washington, D.C., part of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture closed for several hours Wednesday after a noose was discovered in an exhibition on segregation. It was the second such incident in a week. Last Friday, a security guard found a noose hanging from a tree outside the museum. In Los Angeles, police say someone spray-painted the N-word on a gate outside the home of NBA superstar LeBron James Wednesday. The hate crime came just one day before James and the Cleveland Cavaliers are set to take on the Golden State Warriors in the NBA Finals. Speaking to reporters in Oakland, California, LeBron James said the incident was a reminder that being black in America is tough. And I think back to Emmett Till's mom, actually, it's kind of one of the first things I thought of. And, and the reason that she had an open casket is because she wanted to show the world um, what her son went through as far as a hate crime and, you know, being black in America. Um, so it's like it doesn't, no matter how much money you have, um, no matter how famous you are, no matter how many people admire you. Um, you know, being, being black in America is, 
It's tough. In New York City, a grand jury indicted police sergeant Hugh Barry on a murder charge Wednesday in the fatal shooting of 66-year-old African-American Deborah Danner last October. Danner had mental health issues, including schizophrenia. Police say she was shot and killed in her own home in the Bronx after a neighbor called 911. When police arrived, they found Danner naked in her bedroom, holding a pair of scissors. Sergeant Barry has been sued twice in recent years for brutality. On Wednesday, Barry pleaded not guilty to charges of second-degree murder, manslaughter and criminally negligent homicide, and was released on $100,000 bail. And in Maryland, the youngest person to ever head the NAACP entered the race for governor Wednesday. Ben Jealous is known for leading the NAACP's successful campaign to abolish Maryland's death penalty. He's promised to pursue a broad agenda of civil rights, social justice and economic reform. Jealous announced his candidacy Wednesday outside his cousin's West Baltimore flower shop, which he opened after the 2015 uprising and unrest that followed the death of Freddie Gray in Baltimore police custody. In his first speech of his campaign, Jealous called for holding police accountable. We will cut the murder rate. We will lock up the shooters. All right, all right. And we will restore trust by both better training officers, but yes, by also holding officers who kill unarmed civilians oh. fully accountable. On Wednesday, Democracy Now! spoke with Ben Jealous shortly after he announced his bid to become Maryland's next governor. We'll air that interview later in the broadcast. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman.